The universe seems to be endless with no signs of life. While a lot of us might believe there is no extraterrestrial life out there, no one can prove otherwise. But recently, scientists made an incredibly shocking discovery when looking at the second planet from the Sun, Venus. They claim to have found life. But how is it possible that we haven't detected life before on Venus until now? And is there really life on Venus? Venus is an incredibly hot world, but research seems to suggest it once had vast oceans. It's possible that Venus could have been as habitable as the Earth, but in the last billion years, greenhouse gases transformed the planet from an oasis to the uninhabitable hell it is now. The scorched surface becoming too harsh for life forms that may have retreated deep into the ground or into the atmosphere to avoid extinction. In order for us to look at the possibilities for life on the planet, it's interesting to know a little bit about Venus and its evolutionary history. Chances are you've seen the planet Venus many times and didn't know it. You can easily see it from Earth because it's the brightest object in the sky next to the Sun and Earth's moon, and it's visible as a bright star in the morning and evening sky. It's one of only four terrestrial planets in our solar system and considered the Earth's sister planet. Venus is about 20% smaller than Earth and is smaller inside with an iron core 2,400 miles wide. We can't see the surface of the planet from Earth because Venus is covered with thick clouds. But there have been space missions that show it's covered with mountains, volcanoes, craters and huge lava plains. And for the record, those spacecraft didn't last long. This is because temperatures on Venus are hot enough to melt lead at around 880 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough the ground would glow a dull red. The atmospheric pressure at the surface is 92 times the sea level pressure on Earth, or the same as being 3,000 feet underwater. It would crush you, and any spacecraft not built to withstand the immense pressure. The thick clouds are mainly carbon dioxide, but also have a layer of reflective sulfuric acid with the smell of rotten eggs. It's not a place you would want to be, or could survive more than a few seconds. Venus is too close to the Sun to sustain life as we know it, and averages a distance of about 67 million miles away from the Sun. However, about 3 billion years ago, the Sun was only 80% as luminous as it is now. With that in mind, it's possible that this hellish planet could have had an environment much like the Earth. And for about 2 to 3 billion years after the planet formed, life could have had plenty of time to emerge. The Pioneer Venus spacecraft launched by NASA in 1978 and several other space explorations have helped us study the planet and reveal some details on how it transformed from an Earth-like planet to the hellish place it is today. Evidence was found showing there may have been shallow oceans on the surface of Venus for two to three billion years and temperatures on the planet would have ranged from a low of 68 degrees Fahrenheit to a high of 122 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have been easy for life to flourish under these conditions, and where there is water, there is a good chance of life. Ancient Venus was certainly a lot different than it is now, and it's been theorized that it formed out of ingredients similar to Earth, but followed a different evolutionary path. Its rotation rate around the Sun is 117 days compared to Earth's one day. But scientists say it's possible Venus once had the same rotational period as Earth. It had more dry land than the Earth, especially in the tropics. And the surface was ideal for making the planet habitable with plenty of water to support an abundance of life. And there was plenty of land to reduce the planet's sensitivity from incoming sunlight. But around 700 million years ago, some kind of massive resurfacing event triggered a runaway greenhouse effect, causing the planet's atmosphere to become very dense and very hot. No one knows for sure what caused this massive catastrophe to happen, but some researchers believe that volcanic activity may have been the cause as magma and molten rock bubbled to the planet's surface, releasing huge amounts of carbon dioxide trapped in the planet's crust when it rapidly cooled after forming 4.2 billion years ago. This sounds like a scary occurrence, and similar events have happened here on Earth. The Siberian Traps is a huge 3 million square mile region of volcanic rock in Siberia, Russia. It's the evidence of a massive eruptive event that happened in the last 500 million years. The two million year eruption released toxic amounts of greenhouse gases and caused a mass extinction. So now that we know quite a bit about Venus, could simple life forms be struggling to survive on the planet after millions of years? And how would we know? 
Recently, scientists say they've discovered a chemical called phosphine in the clouds of Venus. Phosphine is made up of one atom of phosphorus and three atoms of hydrogen. It's also been detected here on Earth, on Jupiter and Saturn. So how is this discovery of phosphine evidence for life? The one thing that got researchers excited about the smelly flammable gas is that, as far as we know, phosphine can only be made by life, whether it be humans or microbes. Humans have made it to use as a poisonous chemical weapon that was used in World War I, and it's still made as an agricultural fumigant. But the interesting thing is that phosphine is also made naturally by some species of anaerobic bacteria. These are organisms that survive in oxygen-starved environments, such as landfills and marshlands. With that in mind, researchers set out looking for phosphine on other planets, since finding it could indicate the presence of alien metabolisms, and they found it in the clouds of Venus. Using the largest astronomical telescope in the world, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array Telescope, researchers measured trace gases in the Venus atmosphere. Phosphine should not be in the Venusian atmosphere at all. It's extremely hard to produce, and the chemicals in the clouds should destroy the molecules before it can accumulate in amounts large enough to be observed. So, what could be creating the phosphine? Some scientists say it's too early to conclude life does exist on Venus, and that the data needs to be verified, and the phosphine fingerprint could be a false signal introduced by the telescopes or data processing. But if phosphine is really floating through the clouds on Venus, it suggests one of two things. Alien life forms are linking together phosphorus and hydrogen atoms, or there is some completely new chemistry that we don't know about that's creating phosphine in the absence of life. Despite the sulfuric acid in the clouds of Venus, they also carry the basic ingredients for life as we know it – sunlight, water, and organic molecules. And scientists have speculated for nearly 60 years that life could possibly exist on the planet. Near the middle of the cloud layer, temperatures and pressures are nearly Earth-like, and there are molecules in the planet's air that alien microbes could metabolize. The possibility of finding bacterial life in the clouds of Venus is important, because the earliest evidence of life on Earth comes from fossilized mats of cyanobacteria, called stromolites, in Greenland, which are around 3.7 billion years old. But the fact that life could live in such extreme environments is something we already know about. Around 4 billion years ago, there lived a microbe called the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. There is evidence that this microbe lived an alien lifestyle, because it was hidden deep in underground iron sulfur-rich hydrothermal vents. Being both anaerobic and autropic, it didn't breathe air, and made its own food from the dark, metal-rich environment it thrived in. This microbe's metabolism depended on hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, which it turned into organic compounds such as ammonia. The most remarkable thing of all was this tiny life form was the beginning of a long lineage that covers all life on Earth. Now that the biosignature of phosphine gas has been discovered in the clouds of Venus, there are missions being planned by several institutions, including California's Rocket Lab, who plan to send a spacecraft to Venus in 2023 to hunt for definitive signs of life. The mission will use two pieces of Rocket Lab hardware, the 57-foot-tall Electron Booster, which is currently used to launch small satellites into space, and the Photon Satellite Bus, which recently made its debut flight. The Photon will launch atop the Electron Booster, then it'll make its way to Venus on a flyby trajectory. When the Photon gets close enough, it'll deploy a probe into the atmosphere. Its goal will be to hunt for signs of life in the deck of Venus air that is habitable. But before the mission, everyone will get a chance to see the Electron and Photon in action, as it's booked to take a NASA satellite to the Moon in early 2021. And speaking of NASA going to Venus, they have four finalists for the next round of Discovery missions. Two of these newly announced finalists are targeting Venus. One of these is the Da Vinci Plus mission, which would send a probe down through the thick Venusian atmosphere while gathering data on the way. The second is the Veritas mission, which is set to map Venus's surface in detail from orbit. This probe's observations would help show the planet's geological history and could confirm if volcanism and plate tectonics are active on the planet today. Many planetary researchers say that Venus is truly undervalued and that we need more missions to study the planet to get a more detailed understanding of its history and its evolution. This could help us understand what happened to the planet, and if our planet is next, 
and will end up like Venus. Since the beginning of the Space Age, mankind has developed many new technologies to help better study the universe, our galaxy, the solar system, and look for evidence of extraterrestrial life. Look at this tiny pinhole of light in space. That's us. That's planet Earth. On August the 25th, 2012, 35 years after it was launched, Voyager 1 left our solar system. On its way out, it snapped a photo of the Earth from 3.7 billion miles away before turning off its cameras to conserve power. Now it's reached interstellar space and after 43 years and 4 months, the spacecraft still communicates using the Deep Space Network. But Voyager 1 found that interstellar space is a lot weirder than we thought. What have we discovered and why is it so important? In the summer of 1964, NASA developed ways to study the outer planets of the solar system in the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Engineer Gary Flandro predicted that by the end of the 1970s, there'd be a rare alignment of the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune that only occurs once every 175 years. This alignment of the planets would allow mankind to visit all four planets during a single mission. The flight would change its trajectory at each planet and increase the speed of the probe enough to reach the next point in its flight path. Gravity maneuvering or slingshotting is when a spacecraft is pulled by a planet's gravity and increasing speed as it shoots around the planet, saving tons of energy and time. As an example, flight to the farthest planet, Neptune, could only take 12 years instead of 30. The Mariner Jupiter Saturn project began in early 1972 at a cost of $360 million. In March 1977, just a few months before launch, due to the mission's importance, the probes were renamed Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. The Voyagers were equipped with computers that could be reprogrammed, allowing researchers to change programs and fix any problems on the fly. On August the 20th, 1977, Voyager 2 was the first sent into space, 16 days before Voyager 1 would be launched. But because it was on a trajectory that took longer to reach Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 1 would eventually pass it. Since 1962, there's been interplanetary missions to study Venus, Mars and Mercury, with missions lasting up to three years. But the probes would need to last long enough to be part of the Grand Tour project at NASA, which needed two probes to study the four gas giants – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. But it was later suggested that Voyager 1 and 2 visit only two planets. Information in the press spread saying that only Jupiter and Saturn would be visited, reducing the overall cost of the project. Experts looked at over 10,000 trajectories before they chose two that would allow them to fly by Jupiter's largest moon, Io, and then Saturn and its largest moon, Titan. This route also gave the spacecraft the opportunity to continue towards Uranus and Neptune. The thought of extraterrestrial civilizations intercepting these probes was on the minds of researchers. American astronomer Carl Sagan, along with his team, created a golden record with 115 images encoded in analog form, spoken human greetings in 55 languages, a variety of natural earth sounds like wind and thunder, sounds of animals like birds and whales, and different music from around the world. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Which probe made the first planetary mission? The original mission plan was for the Voyagers to operate and last only five years. It would be long enough for them to study Jupiter, Saturn and its rings, and the two planets' largest moons. However, as the mission continued, the ambitions of scientists grew, and the Voyagers outperformed well beyond what was expected. On March 5, 1979, Voyager 1 was 173,983 miles away as it approached Jupiter, and was able to snap images of its moons Io and Europa. And although Jupiter has been one of the most studied planets in our solar system, new photographs gave researchers unseen angles and more information about these planets as if they were new worlds. The new images of Jupiter's closest moon, Io, had yellow, orange and brown surface colors, showing scientists evidence of volcanic rock. 
At least eight active volcanoes were spotted on Io, shooting material into space, and stunning images of this were captured when Voyager flew by. Io turned out to be the most volcanically active body in the solar system. A little over a year after launch, Voyager 1 approached Saturn on November 12, 1980. Expectations were greatly met, and researchers were able to expand their understanding and knowledge of Saturn. Three new moons were discovered, Prometheus, Pandora, and Atlas. But the biggest accomplishment was getting new information about Saturn's largest moon, Titan. It's the only moon in the solar system that has a thick atmosphere. Similarly, it was discovered that the upper layers of Saturn's atmosphere consists of 7% helium, and the rest is hydrogen. Voyager 1 also discovered Saturn's G-rings, disc-shaped planes made of ice and dust. Another interesting discovery was Saturn's sixth largest moon, Enceladus, which was found to reflect more solar light than any other object in the solar system because of the fresh, clean ice covering its surface. Images were captured that showed its crater-ridden landscape, indicating some geological activity under the surface that could be a source of heat for a liquid ocean. But Voyager 2 was about to make some discoveries of its own. On July the 9th, 1979, Voyager 2 made its closest approach to Jupiter and snapped this amazing photo of Jupiter and its moon Io, casting a shadow on the gas giant. On August the 25th, 1981, after successfully arriving at Saturn, the probe snapped images of the gas giant's rings and moons. It was clear at this point that Voyager 2 could now fly to Uranus with all its instruments remaining functional. NASA asked for more money and instructed the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory to extend the Voyager 2 mission. When Voyager 2 approached Neptune, researchers didn't think they'd see anything other than darkness. NASA crews increased the size of Deep Space Station's radio antenna in Canberra, Australia to catch the incredibly weak radio signals that the probe was relaying from Neptune. On August 25, 1989, Voyager 2 was 30,000 miles away from the eighth planet in the solar system. Approximately 30 times farther from the Sun than the Earth, Neptune receives only 0.01% more sunlight than the Earth. In almost complete darkness, Voyager 2 started taking mysterious photographs. They revealed the makeup of the blue planet, showing the presence of methane, six new moons, and four rings. Like Saturn and Uranus, the rings and Neptune's four moons made a complex, interconnected system. The probe also discovered winds measuring 1,500 miles per hour around a strange, previously unseen place on Neptune named the Great Dark Spot, a massive rotating storm the size of the planet Earth. In fact, both planets, Uranus and Neptune, are known for strong winds that can reach supersonic speeds 10 to 15 times stronger than on Earth. Uranus and Neptune were originally thought to be gas giants, but in the 90s, it was discovered that they were made up of heavier substances and they became a distinct class of planets called ice giants. Triton was no less impressive. This moon of Neptune is located to the planet's north. It's the coldest of all natural bodies astronomers have discovered at a frosty minus 391 degrees Fahrenheit. Voyager 2 was able to approach the planet at a distance of about 25,000 miles and discovered active geysers that spewed nitrogen into space. Triton was the final object that the space probe would meet in the solar system before heading out into the great unknown.